Google Fiber starts with internet speeds up to a gigabit a second. It's internet 100 times faster than what most Americans have today. Is my internet so fast? So fast. Remember Google Fiber? Way back in 2010, Google sought to win the broadband internet market by introducing revolutionary internet speeds of 1 gigabit per second. They were looking to achieve this by introducing fiber optic technology to the general market. This was quite a bold move as the legacy players like AT&T, Comcast, and Charter had such a stronghold on the market. But if anyone was capable of taking on these giants, it was someone like Google. Things started off strong for Google Fiber as they launched in Kansas followed by Texas, Utah, and Tennessee. It seemed like Google was doing it. They were putting legacy players to shame as people flocked to Google's offerings. But this success did not last too long. In the mid-2010s, AT&T would start hitting back and they would flex just how powerful they truly were. While Google Fiber was expanding city by city, AT&T would announce a nationwide rollout covering dozens of cities. And they weren't bluffing either given that they would spend an eye-watering $140 billion to make that vision a reality. This was obviously a massive morale hit for Google, and they would soon announce that they were cutting their fiber staff by half. To make things worse, AT&T and Charter would start sabotaging Google Fiber by suing them and pulling political favors. It seems like all this pressure was too much for CEO Craig Barrett to handle as he would step down during the worst of it. But the nail in the coffin didn't come till the late 2010s, by which point AT&T had finished much of their critical rollout. Suddenly, Google was no longer introducing fiber to new areas. Many of the cities that they were expanding to already had fiber thanks to AT&T. And it didn't help that AT&T was not only cheaper but more reputable from the general public's perspective. With no choice left, Google would actually begin to leave certain cities that they had pioneered, like Louisville, Kentucky. Since then, we haven't heard much news from Google. Apparently, they're still expanding and have plans of moving into five new states. But it's not clear how much of this will come to fruition, especially with the recession. Objectively, it looks like Google bit off way more than they could chew, and they got put in their place. But what if I told you that Google knew that this would happen from the very beginning, and this wasn't their worst case scenario? It was actually the scenario that they were betting on. So here's why Google Fiber was actually Google's most successful failure. To understand why Google entered the broadband market as a whole, we'll have to take a look back at the state of fiber internet before Google. You see, fiber optic data transmission is by no means a new technology. It was actually demonstrated way back in 1965 by a German physicist named Manfred Borner. And NASA even used fiber optic cables in the cameras that they sent to the moon. At first, the technology wasn't commercially viable given that it required an extremely intensive manufacturing process. High quality optical fibers could barely be manufactured at 2 meters per second. But by 1983, this would be increased all the way to 50 meters per second. This actually meant that producing fiber optic cables was cheaper than producing traditional copper cables. But despite these revolutionary findings, the broadband internet would head in a completely different direction dial-up internet. If you're not familiar with dial-up, it consists of calling a specified phone number and getting internet connection through your phone cable. This resulted in extremely slow speeds of 56 kilobits per second or even lower, but this was actually for the best. When you're introducing a new technology, you want to reduce barriers to adoption by as much as possible. So the fact that internet could work through phone lines that already existed around the world was a massive win. But over time, this quickly turned into the internet's biggest inhibitor as well. You see, ISPs figured, why create new infrastructure if we don't have to? And this led to the broadband industry becoming fixated on two offerings, DSL and cable. DSL was offered by telephone providers and aimed to leverage phone lines as much as possible. Meanwhile, cable internet was offered by cable providers and aimed to leverage cable lines as much as possible. 
There was also a third medium of internet which sought to leverage satellite infrastructure. But this never really took off, resulting in a duopoly between DSL and the cable providers. Sometimes DSL providers made some sort of advancement and edged out cable providers. Other times, cable providers made some sort of advancement and edged out DSL providers. But neither was radically better than the other. Also, these so-called advancements were by no means breakthroughs. They usually consisted of improvements from 1 megabit per second to 2 megabits per second or 2 megabits per second to 4 megabits per second. While these were admittedly 2x increases, they were nothing in comparison to the 100, 500, 1000x increases that were possible through fiber. There was a sort of unspoken agreement between the DSL providers and the cable providers that they would both stick to their lanes and not do anything too ambitious. And given that no startup could challenge their dominance, these ISPs pretty much set the rules. But no one really cared either. Virtually no one needed speeds of 300, 200, or even 100 megabits per second in the 1990s and 2000s. I mean, all people were doing with the internet was forums, emails, and light social media. But all of this would change after 2010. While ISPs had stuck to linear improvements, companies based on the internet were growing exponentially, and so was their need for speed. Likely the two best examples of this are streaming and gaming. 4K TVs have become dirt cheap, and basically every streaming platform offers 4K options, whether it be YouTube or Netflix. But the biggest bottleneck to making 4K streaming a reality was broadband internet. To stream 480p, you only need 1.1 megabits per second, but to stream 4K, you need 20 megabits per second. And that's if you're the only person using the internet in your household. If you live with your family or roommates, you need speeds of 50 or 100 megabits per second so that everyone can use the internet comfortably. The same thing applies to gaming as well given that the industry was moving away from physical copies. To download these new 100 or 150 gigabyte games, you needed much faster speeds than 4 megabits per second. At that rate, it would literally take days to download these games. But at least that's a one-time problem. To actually enjoy many of these online games, you need reliable ping, which simply wasn't feasible through the traditional offerings. Clearly, it was time for disruption, but ISPs weren't gonna disrupt themselves. So enter Google. Google's incentives for radically improving internet speeds were obvious. I mean, they're the largest internet company in the world. If anyone has takes in the internet becoming better, it's them. And it's not just for mindlessly watching YouTube videos in 4K. That right there was probably the least of their concerns. Their real concern was productive applications like video calls through Google Hangouts, virtual classrooms through Chrome OS and Google Classroom, and most importantly, the cloud through Google Cloud. If they wanted any of these applications to take off, they needed ISPs to ditch DSL and cable and switch to fiber or something even better. And as a result, they would step up to the plate with Google Fiber. And they went straight for the big guns. They didn't even bother aiming for numbers with units of MB. They went straight for 1 gigabit per second. Keep in mind, this was during a time when most people were struggling to get speeds of 1 megabit per second. So speeds of 1 gigabit per second were very much unfathomable, at least for me. For Google, these speeds were nothing given that it took a lot more horsepower to run their massive data centers, networks, and servers. For perspective, Google needed 1 petabit per second or 1 million gigabits per second to run their Jupyter network-based data centers way back in 2015. Who knows how much they need today? So theoretically speaking, offering fiber shouldn't have been that difficult in terms of technology. Google just had to make a fraction of what they were capable of available to the end customers. But as we so often find, theory doesn't always translate to reality. That didn't matter though because they had no intention of actually overtaking said ISPs. But wait a minute, if Google was gonna get into the broadband game, they might as well try to grow a new sector and displace the legacy players, right? 
Well, the answer is actually absolutely not from a financial perspective. Here's the thing, it cost AT&T $140 billion to accomplish a semi-nationwide fiber rollout. And that's despite their decades of experience, hundreds of billions of dollars worth of existing infrastructure and telecommunications being their primary focus and business. If Google were to try to achieve this from scratch, it would cost them $200 or $300 billion, especially given Google's top-of-the-market salaries. But even if we assumed that they were somehow able to get it done for $100 billion, it still makes no sense. You see, Google's entire market cap back in 2010 was only $300 to $400 billion. This means that if they actually took Fiber seriously, they would essentially be betting a third of their entire net worth on this market. And much of this would probably have to be paid for using debt. That itself is a pretty bad situation, but it gets exponentially worse when you consider opportunity cost. Take YouTube for example. There's no official market cap for YouTube, but I think we can all agree that YouTube is worth at least $100 billion. But do you know what Google paid for YouTube? A mere $1.65 billion. An even better example is Android. Again, I think we can all agree that Android is worth at least $100 billion. But do you know what Google paid for Android? A disgusting $50 million. So with $100 billion, Google can either bet on 60 potential YouTubes, 2,000 potential Androids, or they can try to challenge AT&T and take over the broadband market. Even if Google Fiber grew to become the entire size of AT&T, that's only $135 billion. In other words, Google can either bet on creating 60 YouTubes, 2,000 Androids, or one AT&T. For obvious reasons, even a fool would not choose the AT&T option. And that's why Google created Fiber, knowing that it would likely never blow up. But that didn't matter. Google Fiber didn't need to blow up to be successful. It just needed to threaten the monopolies of ISPs. And that's exactly what it did. The ISPs fired back so hard that they've actually started to out-offer Google Fiber. Google only offers up to 2 gigabits per second, while AT&T offers up to 5 gigabits per second. Granted, it is quite expensive. The same thing can be said about Verizon, Xfinity, Spectrum, CenturyLink, Optimum, and basically any other ISP that you can think of. We should also mention that previously unthinkable breakthroughs have suddenly come about regarding cable internet. Somehow, the same cable providers are now able to provide speeds of up to 500 megabits per second for the same price. In the end, Google Fiber was never meant to become a household name when it comes to broadband internet. Even if Google was capable of accomplishing something like this, it simply wouldn't be worth the cost, effort, and time required to actually make that vision a reality. However, what Google could accomplish with relatively low effort was reignite the stagnant ISP industry. And looking at the results, it appears that Google Fiber was a bigger success than their wildest dreams. Did you realize what game Google was playing with Fiber? Comment that down below. Also, drop a like if you're glad that ISPs are finally doing something. And of course, consider checking out our Discord community to suggest future video ideas and consider subscribing to see more questions logically answered. But until then, I'm Hari, and I'll see you guys on the next one.